Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusker here for another edition of the show. And uh, well, we are going to start a series of episodes where um, we're going to be doing wines from wine, sorry not wine, from underground cellars. Now I bought a total of 12 wines from them. Now a couple of them are a little bit of duplication so we're not going to get six shows out of it. I think we're going to get like five shows out of it. But um, these are going to be wines, and, and then I may not do all five in a row. There might be some wines in between that I have bought elsewhere or if I'm out in the wine shop and I see something I really want to do, uh, I'll do that instead. But uh, we're going to have a series of wine shows dedicated to wines I bought from Underground Cellar. So let's go over what Underground Cellar is real quick. Um, they are one of many services online that you can buy wine. Um, they are also similar to other things where they have an offer and it's for a short amount of time and the people who get into the offer usually get wines for um, some type of deal. Now, Underground Cellars deal is that they offer the wine for X number of hours and I think it's usually two or three days worth. Um, it's, it's at least 24 hours. I think their, their usual time is two, three, sometimes even four days. I think it depends on their offer, how many bottles they have for the offer. But um, the, the price you pay is the minimum for what the cheapest bottle is. So in the case of the bottle I have here, the first one we're gonna do, uh, that bottle was uh, $20. So you get that bottle and then you potentially, well, you, you purchase a $20, you say, I'm gonna do one bottle. and for $20. Now you will most likely get the $20 bottle. However, they usually have three, four, maybe even five other bottles that you can get that are higher priced. Now they have less of those bottles, so you have less of a chance of getting them. Now the other thing is if you purchase more bottles for the offer, you know, not one at a time, but if you say, well, I want three bottles of the offer, I think three typically is the minimum number of bottles where you will always where you'll get at least one of the bottles as an upgrade, and they call them an upgrade. So like in, in the offer for this one, I think there were like four wines. So um, if I'd bought three wines for that offer, I would have gotten at least one of the bottles would have been a higher price bottle. There's no guarantee which one you're gonna get, but it could be a higher price bottle. If you buy six bottles, I think three of the bottles typically are guaranteed to be upgrades. Now when I first joined them, I don't remember these guaranteed upgrades things. Um, so I don't know if they implemented that later or why they implemented it, but I know that one of the things that I like about that is at least you don't feel like you're rolling the dice and you're gonna come up craps in this in essence. That you know the, their their stick, their their little hook is to get you to buy a wine with the hopes, the gamble, I'm a gambler, trust me, um, with the hopes of getting a higher price wine. If you buy the one bottle, chances are you're going to get the regular one. I don't think it's like set in stone. Um, actually, I think I think this one might have been one that I got the upgrade. I, just, I, I bought one bottle of the offer and I got the upgrade. I don't remember. Um, but anyway, uh, so that's, that's their deal with that. Now, one of the things they have changed since I first started, at least how I remember things were, is when you bought, well, when you, when you, you did your purchase, now you have to wait for the order to sell out or for the time to expire. If the time expires, nothing happens. You don't get charged anything, whatever. If you, uh, if, if the offer sells out, then everybody who, per, you know, everyone who placed an order gets charged for whatever they bought, you know, and again, like say, you know, I wanted three bottles, so I'm gonna charge 60 bucks, plus whatever, any other taxes or fees or anything associated with that. Um, 
but I could have one $20 bottle and two bottles that were higher priced or two bottles that were $20 and one because of the guarantee that was higher priced. Um, so then after you have that, when, at first when I would, when the order, when the offer would be over, I would go look at the offer and I, it wouldn't tell you what you got. So that was a little frustrating because you didn't know for sure if you got the upgrade or not. Now they tell you flat out, hey, you got the upgrade. Or they don't say, they just tell you, hey, you bought three bottles, two bottles are this, one bottle's that, blah, blah, blah. And they tell you what they are and what the retail was supposed to be of that. So at least now you know what you got. Um, the other cool thing they have, and I really think this was really cool, is that they have uh, a virtual locker, basically, or a virtual seller, I'm sorry. So, or a cloud seller, I think is actually what they call it. So for somebody like me who lives in Texas, uh, I can buy wine, say, throughout the warmer months of the year and not worry about shipping. And I can have it shipped whenever I want um, at any time. Now, the key, though, with this is you need, if you get 12 bottles into your cellar, then your shipping's free. Now, it's like standard regular shipping. You're not going to get like overnight or anything like that for free, but you get free standard shipping. So that's really cool. So I can buy wine throughout the year, uh, maybe buy, a, buy you know, one bottle a month if I want to, or buy three bottles in this offer, a few on that one. When I get to 12 bottles, and let's say it's not July, okay, or August, or even September in Texas, I can have the wine shipped to me um, and not have to worry about the wine encountering 90 degree, 100 degree weather um, on the UPS truck possibly on the porch of the house, and the porch actually faces west, so you get great sun exposure to the front door. Um, they're not supposed to leave it there, but it has happened. Matter of fact, uh, one of my wine orders uh, that was sent to me, that, that happened. Um, it was, they showed up, said, I need a signature. I wasn't here, so I, can't, so I, I pretty much wait the whole day at the house, and I leave and I come back after dinner and I have a box sitting there. <laughs> Luckily, it wasn't 100 degree weather either. It was like 80s, something like that. High, well, low 90s, I think, at that point of the day. So it wasn't too bad. Anyway, so Underground Cellar, check it out. I'll have a link below uh, for it. They had a t a contacted me about doing uh, a thing with them, but unfortunately, I was training with my new job. And um, by the time I would have been back to even produce a video, it would have been near the end of their promotion. So I, I just let them know that, hey, can't do it. They did offer to give me free shipping. And I said, well, I already have a locker full or seller full of 12 bottles. So I get free shipping anyway. So they said, well, airmail it to you. I'm like, okay. Well, no fault through really anyone's own. I'm not like complaining about it because I think it was just kind of funny. Something fell through the cracks. I mean, I got, the, I got the wine. Trust me, I got the wine. However, I wanted to get the wine during a specific week because the weather was really good here in Texas, believe it or not, in May of all times. Uh, but when, when the wine showed up, it wasn't bad. I mean, it wasn't, we weren't having 100 degree weather. The wine didn't get cooked or anything like that. All right, so other housekeeping real quick. Back on iTunes officially now. Uh, as of earlier this week, I'm recording this on um, July 17th. Uh, as of the 15th, actually the 14th, uh, I was back on iTunes. I'm super stoked about that. It also looks like the service I'm using, which is through a plugin called PowerPress uh, on my WordPress thing through Blueberry. Um, it looks like they also have my podcast in a directory of other, so that if somebody uses some other type of what they call podcatcher, they're getting it that way. Uh, because I was showing up in the stats before I was on iTunes um, when I created the feed. So um, uh, that's good. Uh, TiVo, I'm still technically, as of right now, still on them through Blip, uh, through that feed. When that's going to stop, I don't know, or as far as Blip being able to do it, but I'm working on using the same feed that feeds iTunes uh, for Blip. Now, if that exact feed isn't going to work, I'll create something else because I think it's more about the file format than anything else. So. Uh, but I'm working with uh, this gentleman I've been working with actually for a couple years now at TiVo. He's super awesome. His name is Kanchan Randall. Um, anyway, so he's been doing an awesome job with uh, any type of technical support over the years through uh, TiVo. And I've learned a lot of things about RSS feeds and what TiVo wants and um, things that just that uh, you don't necessarily get even looking on the internet. Uh, also, as of probably today, the post probably went up about what was going on with the whole iTunes debacle um, and how I got back on. Very long-winded, as you know it can be. 
Um, so if you've watched the video and you haven't been to the website, go to the web, hit the website, check out the post. Uh, I'll have the upshot, which I pretty much already told you. And then I'll have the long drawn out process of what worked and what didn't work. Um, so if you are interested in knowing that or kind of going, what if, what did, did you do this? Yeah, I did. It didn't work. All right. Matter of fact, I have to add to the post. I'm just going to put the list of what did not work. All right. Um, cool little holder for the uh, micro thing for the audio deal. All right. So let's get into the wine. We're almost at 10 minutes. So I actually may have three commercial breaks on this thing. Next, next episode will probably be 20 minutes because I'm only going to do two wines and there shouldn't be any housekeeping because I'm recording it the same day. All right. So let's get into uh, wine number one. Okay. Got this from Underground Cellar. Now this is the non-vintage uh, non vintage Tess Red and White Blend Napa Valley. Now the Underground Cellar offer was $20 and you could have gotten this wine and some other wines. Uh, I didn't get any of those wines. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through the whole offer. It's kind of hard to find the offer again on the website itself. It'd be kind of cool if I could, you know, when you do your orders uh, Underground, if I could click to see what the original offer was um, for all that, but I get it. It's, you know, I actually, this one, no, I'm sorry. The next episode, I found the offer off of Google because I was looking stuff up for it. It was very hard to find things. So I actually found the offer um, archived. So that would be kind of cool. Anyway, so Tess Weiner, before we get into the, get, before we get into the bottle here, uh, let's go back to talk about Tess real quick. All right, so Tess Winery um, is the two daughters, um, Ariana and Lisa Peju, of uh, their parents own the Peju Province Winery. Um, they were originally in Southern California, moved up to Napa Valley, I think in the early 80s, um, created their winery. Uh, they're in, um, are, they in the, are they in Rutherford? Yeah, it's in the Rutherford area. Uh, it doesn't have a Rutherford AVA on it, um, just Napa Valley, but they're in the Ruth Rutherford area. Um, they've been making wines for a very long time. So the story is that the two daughters, um, you know, got very, were very uh, much involved in the winery. It was a family winery. Uh, so they're involved in everything that's, that's has to do with making wine from helping out in the vineyard to helping out with making the wine and the, um, the tasting room and all that. So they, they had a very, um, uh, very, uh, they had a background of getting into wine. Uh, the girls went off to school. They eventually, uh, were into wine in school and all that. They came back. Uh, to work at the family winery. Um, and then I don't know how many years ago, but very a few years ago, they, they created their own wine uh, called Tess. Now, um, on the back label, they say Tess, Tess means harvest. Well, I was like, what? What are you talking about Tess means harvest? And, and I'm like, I'm the guy that wants to like drill down and find out where this, where did this information come from? You know, is this just some marketing fluff? You know, someone decided test means harvest. So I was going through Google and at first, you know, I get like, you know, all those name, you know, name, meaning of people's names, baby name meaning, right? And it just was test, harvest. Okay. W how do you know that? All right. Because a lot of times those, I'm skeptical sometimes of the name meanings and where do they get the source from? Okay. Um, as a guarantee, they got it from each other probably a lot of times. So I dig a little deeper. Uh, it took a little while, but I've got it. So um, Tess is a dimin dim diminutive of Teresa. All right. Now Teresa is the actual uh, root or or the the name that has the association with harvest. It's considered to be uh, from a Greek verb of terizo. Okay, makes sense. Um, or maybe it's terizo. I don't know. I don't know how they how it's accented. Um, and terzo is the uh, Greek verb for to harvest, okay? So they think that's where the name comes from. All right, so test means harvest. Awesome, I love that fact. Um, and they have their, you know, their whatever marketing fluff on there, blah, 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 blah. Um, but well, marketing fluff, actually some history. Um, this red and white blend is when they were children, they would, their parents would be like, let them mix wines at the table. So they were, so they were creating a blend of wines, all right? And, uh, and, and the reason I bought this, because I thought it was very interesting, it was a red and white blend. So I've never had, well, I have had that. I'm sorry. There are wines out there that combine red and white grapes, um, but they're not prominent. You don't, and it's not, it's not put on the label necessarily. It's just kind of 
known that you'll have, it usually is a red wine that has white grapes in it, okay? Um, but anyway, so they, they don't have their own vineyard per se, okay, under the Tess Winery. They actually are using their family's winery, okay, their vineyard, which is the Persephone Vineyard. Okay, so how many of you remember your Greek mythology? That was my specialty in high school. Um, so Persephone is the daughter of Demeter. Demeter is the goddess of the harvest. Persephone was taken down to Hades and through a bunch of you know little shady stuff that uh, Hades did. Um, and uh, she's allowed to come up six months out of the year, you know, all the pomegranate and the seeds and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, she's associated with the spring and the harvest, okay, um, throughout the whole uh, mythology thing. So I think it was very cool that they have they already had a vineyard named Persephone. Um, so somewhere along the line they, they had a reason for that. Um, I didn't expect this to uh, to fade on me that quickly. Anyway, um, so they had that and they created a wine named Tess. I think that was really cool. So I'm, I'm looking forward to trying this out. Uh, so what I was trying to say is it was technically not a state grown, but man, it's about as close as it can get. It's really the family's winery uh, and they're just making a wine under a different brand name, okay? So they technically can't put a state bottle, but they can put produced and bottled uh, by a test winery. Um, all right, so they said the, it's an, it was a, the blend is from experiments of childhood mixing wines at the dinner table. Um, it is aged for 10 months in 20% neutral French oak, or 10 months, 20% of it in neutral French oak. Now, neutral French oak technically means it's at least three years old. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't impart any characteristics. It just means the amount of characteristics that it, it could impart are considered neutral, but it's going to affect the wine a little bit. Now, we don't know how old the old oak barrels are. These could be eight-year-old barrels and versus three-year-old barrels, but neutral is neutral is when you're talking about the technicalities. Um, and they suggest it be served like a white wine. They actually suggest it be chilled to 45 degrees. Um, now, this is non-vintage, um, so I'm not sure... You know, if, how, where, where, how the grapes as far as when they were harvested and all that, and if this is kind of leftovers or they specifically are holding grapes a certain way, but it's a non-vintage. They suggest, they already suggest 45 degrees serving temperature. Uh, it's probably not 45 degrees anymore. Uh, it was in the fridge for actually quite a while. I took it out this morning to do research. Um, I actually took it out last night to do research and never got there. Um, Watch the SPs. Won't go into too much of that, but Stuart Scott you are the man. Um, anyway, um, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, find it. Um, anyway, so uh, I just couldn't, I just wasn't in the right state of mind uh, to do wine reviews after all that. So uh, the wine did stay out overnight and then I put it back in the fridge uh, for a little bit to chill it just slightly. So um, it is a blend of 85% red and 15% white varietals. Uh, they are Cab, said Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Zinfandel, Cabernet Franc, and then uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, and Petit Verdot. So quite a few. Um, I mean, it's it's pretty much. It's kind of like a Meritage with Zinfandel, Sauvignon Blanc, and Chardonnay. <laughs> and if you want to really think about it. It's, it's kind of a Meritage, because Meritage can also be a white wine, because those have to be uh, Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc and Muscadel, okay? That one I wasn't too sure about, was I? Uh, but a white Bordeaux, I mean, a white Meritage can be, you know, the white grapes of Bordeaux. So, I mean, Sauvignon Blanc is a white grape of Bordeaux. Um, let's see, I think that was all the notes. I wanted to hit. So let's see what it's like. I mean, it's, it's pretty light. Where's my, where's my white card? I mean, it's pretty light. It's, it's really almost orange-like. And I know I've got a red tablecloth and, and the lights are a little bit, and there's a little bit of sediment actually to it. So, um, yeah, a little bit of sediment in the glass. I'm actually surprised by that. Um, so, um, First of all, was, was the glass dirty? I was like, no, I cleaned it. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, it really kind of has like this orangish hue to it. Um, it. 
brick is the name that comes to mind, but we were taught don't use brick because brick comes in many colors. But it has that, that almost rusty orange type of uh, color to it. Now, when I look at it this way, it's much redder because I've got the red background. All right, so on the nose, it's, I wouldn't consider it really a fruit forward uh, wine. I do get, um, I guess probably cherry more than anything else. Actually, I'd almost get, even get like blackberry, okay, which I don't. I don't talk about black fruit very much. Usually I talk about red fruit. It's about the only fruit I really ever talk about when I pick stuff up. I don't only talk about blueberries or blue fruit or black fruit um, other than like stone fruit, okay? But as far as the, those, those color fruits, I pretty much only uh, deal with red. The light seems to be flickering in here. Anyway. And a bit of minerality to it. Actually, I almost want to say a fleeting, a fleeting bit of caramel. Yeah. Like almost like those caramel candies, like you get at Halloween, you know, or usually Halloween, the Brock's uh, caramel. So, so good. That's really about it. Let's hit into the wine. Really good. I mean, still get that caramel type of thing with kind of a, um, a cocoa and a cherry and blackberry. I still get all those. I mean, and all this stuff is all this stuff is really subtle. It's not. I mean, the caramel is actually the thing that I think that hits me the most. Uh, it's really subtle. Um, it's a bit fleshy. Tannins are medium at best. Acidity is obviously medium plus almost high. Okay. Because I got a lot of a lot of saliva going on. My mouth is really watering. It's a nice drinkable wine. I even get almost, felt like I'm getting a little bit of peach, you know, maybe even a bit of grapefruit type of apple. Like I, I think, I think what's happening is that that Chardonnay and that Cabernet and that Zinfandel blend. I mean, even though the, the white, white varietal is only 15%, we don't know how much other percentages of the Sauvignon Blanc and the Chardonnay are. Don't know if it's equal parts or one is more than the other, but it's it's really kind of a neat combination. I've no, I I don't think I've ever had a wine like this. Well, I've never had a wine like this for sure, um, but a wine that has combines red and white varietals, where I've kind of really thought about what the white varietals are bringing. But I almost feel like I'm getting apple peel, um, like almost green apple peel um, on the mouth. So I think this is an extremely interesting. And really decent wine. It's twenty bucks. It's it's priced about right. Um, this is not a this is not a wine that I think um, needs to be priced lower than twenty bucks. Technically, it's nineteen ninety nine when you go to the winery's website. So twenty bucks. Um, and it's not a wine that I think you know is drinking like a forty or fifty dollar bottle of wine. But I think it's pretty good. I think it's pretty good. All right, I'm going to see if I can get these light. The, the, actually, it's the light there on the camera that's flickering. So I think if I, I think the battery just isn't um, fully um, into the thing. So we're going to go to the next wine here. And uh, I'm going to mess with the lighting, and we'll see you here in a couple seconds. 
All right, and we're back for wine number two. I didn't mess with the light. It, it looks like it's stabilized. So wine number two, let's get right into this one. So yeah, another underground cellar uh, wine, and I'm real excited about this one. Um, what, one of the things I forgot to mention in the last one, because when I was talking so highly of this of the test wine, is that they're um, just like other like a lot of these other online places. You know, no matter who they are, they're always trying to find like those those hidden gems, those those uh, you know special wines that you can't really find retail. So they're they're reaching out to wineries to give them better distribution. I mean, that's really the upshot. If I was if I was the underground seller, I'm going to go to ABC Winery and say, hey, you know, I know a lot of your winery, your a lot of your wine sales are coming from, you know, club, you know, uh, club sales or your your wine room, but you, you have a lot of wine left over, right? Yeah, I got a lot of wine left over. Couldn't really sell all of it out. Well, you know, I got a website. I'm going to sell the rest of your wine for you. Uh, I'll sell it for the price that you, you have. And then what they do is they just include it in some type of deal. Or I'm like, hey, do you have like a bunch of different, like a, like a, not necessarily a vertical, but you have wines, a variety of wines from you that you want to sell. And I'll make the deal with you that uh, I'm going to pay you this much money for it. And then I'm going to sell it for this. And I'm going to make money by everyone's going to pay this much. You don't give me blah, 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 you know, whatever it is. So those are underground sellers doing other places. They have other little deals that they do. Anyway, you know, Woot.Wine was really the first one that I ever used for stuff like this. And I haven't bought anything from Woot in a long time, but I used to always look at that stuff, you know, midnight, Monday, uh, see what was happening. And I haven't done that in a long time. I think it's just because I haven't seen anything on there that I, it just inspired me to buy. Plus, you know, you're always buying like three and five and six pack deals of wine. And it's usually the same wine. And I'm kind of like, I, I need to buy wine for review. Anyway, so let's get into this one. Uh, now, this wine is the Adanada, I swear to God, so it says Adanada, um, the Adanada uh, Barbaresco 2003 is from the uh, Sichin, I'm going to say, or Chichin Vineyard in Barbaresco. Now, I took a lot of digging to figure out what Chichin, C-I-C-H-I-N was on this label. I really... Barbaresco Italian wines in general, uh, I don't have uh, a huge knowledge of how things are, especially with labeling. So I didn't know what that was. I didn't know, I had no clue. I was like, what does it mean? It took a long time to figure that out because you know what? Nobody ever lists the vineyards of Barbaresco and Barolo. Anyway, so it is a vineyard in the Barbaresco area near the, um, near the uh, Treso or the, yeah, the, the Treso uh, commune. Uh, is where this winery is located. Uh, the Adonata um, is, uh, they don't have a whole lot of information on this. Uh, they are imported by the Vignoli Selection Importer. Um, and all it really says is that the Nada family purchased the property in 1919 and it's located in the heart of Barbaresco. And then it has a couple other things, but um, that's about all we know. And uh, so, Let's kind of go over Barbaresco real quick. So this is made from the Nebbiolo grape. Now Barbaresco is in the Piedmonte or the Piedmont region. Uh, I'm sorry, the Piedmonte or the Piedmont region of northwestern Italy. Northwestern, I guess, for the camera view. Um, anyway, so northwestern Italy, because this would be northeastern if you're watching. So, um, and Barbaresco is a cousin of Barolo. They both use the same grape. Barbaresco is about 10 miles northwest, sorry, yeah, northeast, I'm sorry, of Barolo. And uh, while they both make wines from the same grape, they are definitely different. Um, Barbaresco is considered um, a little bit lighter version of Barolo. Um, they have different soils, so their, their wines are going to have different characteristics anyway. And Barbaresco is typically aged one year less than what a Barolo is aged, depending on the type of uh, level you're at. Like a regular Barbaresco is aged for two years, and it's like law required. Uh, whereas Barolo is three years, and then Barbaresco Reserva is four years versus five years for a Barolo. I didn't even have to look at my notes for that one. Anyway, it's because this is the stuff I already kind of knew and just have to remember. Did I mention I'm participating in the Texas Best Sommelier competition? A Texom in about three weeks. Good Lord, I got to study. Anyway, um, that's no joke. I mean, this is 
kind of like the advanced exam. I'm doing it for the experience um, to, to get that kick in the to show how much you really need to know. All right, so um, this was part of a, um, all right, so I'm sorry, this was uh, for Underground Seller, this was part of an $18 deal, and this wine retails for about 40 bucks. Um, I've actually seen it a little bit more, but maybe not this vintage um, euro price, so 36 bucks to sell euro, so even more US retail. But 2003 apparently was a, pretty ex, um, different year. I, I don't want to say exceptional for the, uh, for the region, um, but it was a very, very hot year, so it, it influenced the wine in a different way than, say, some of the other years, and apparently 2002 was a really bad year um, because of hailstorms, so this was like, you know, kind of like a, I'm going to say a bounce back year, but um, and apparently every, pretty much every vintage since 1995 is considered a good vintage, but not, 2003 was notable, let's put it that way, because of the, how hot it was. All right, again, on the color. Now, this definitely has that, that brownish color to it, uh, almost orange and uh, kind of orange and brown. Uh, that, as I learned this past week when we had a Barolo from, I think, 2003 also. Now, maybe it was older. Yeah, it was older. I'm sorry. It was like, I'm sorry, 1993, okay, um, which was phenomenal, by the way. Thank you, Fabian, for bringing it. Um, Fabian's awesome. He's a, a psalm here in San Antonio. Anyway, uh, uh, and took the exam with me at the same time, certified. So uh, this is a characteristic of a Piedmont, of a Nebbiolo from Barolo or Barresco. Get your education going on. This smells like an Italian wine. Actually, did I get olive out of it? Yeah. Now, it has that, what I usually call accordion case smell to it. So that's leather, felt, and dust, okay? Really kind of a, not even just dust, like mustiness, okay? So like someone's basement. I don't want to say basement because basements can be not wet moldy, just kind of that dry, musty smell. Kind of barnyard, but you don't get the funk. Oh, well, maybe a little bit. But I can kind of see olives out of this too. Fruit. Maybe cherry. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to kind of grass for straws on that one, I think, because I know I'm supposed to have that type of thing. And the floral, I mean, we're supposed to, I'm, I think if I remember, I'm supposed to smell like roses or some type of floral. I don't really get it. I'm very weak on the floral side of things. It's got to be really, really prominent in a wine for me to get that. But, I mean, there is there's a fruit quality to it, um, a red, generic red fruit quality to it that would probably associate with cherry. And kind of like furniture, like there's like a wood and like a, a fabric type of, um, you know, old furniture in, in, in like your aunt's or grandmother's house type of thing. Not dirty furniture, just it's, it's, it's been used for a long time. And I keep going down that path. I mean, this is why I, I probably would want to smell a lot longer, um, but in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and hit hit the palate because there's not much else I'm going to get really out of the wine. So the reason for that, that look on my face at first, it was almost like a Listerine, <laughs> like a Listerine mouth. I mean, I'm, I'm swishing it like mouth, mouthwash, right? It was almost like this Listerine minty flavor, okay? Not Listerine in the alcohol um, in a bad sense. It was just kind of like, like this almost mintiness to it. And I was like, am I, I got Listerine in my mouth? 
very dry, uh, high tannins, okay? Another characteristic of these wines, um, Barolo is even higher tannins. This is a 2003. It probably needs to be decanted. Um, I don't know what we're having for dinner tonight, but we're drinking this wine tonight. I'm going to decant it. I haven't used my decanter. Where is my decanter? I don't know. Anyway, oh, right over here. I looked right through it, you know. A classic. Yeah, you can tell I haven't used this decanter in a while. Um, a classic. Not classic, but just a typical, like, really high surface area decanter. Um, anyway, it was cheap. And I needed a decanter, or I wanted to have one so I could understand what decanters were. And it was kind of about, the thing was that one and a smaller one. It was looked more like a tea pitcher. So, anyway. God, man, this is, this is really nice wine. This is, I mean, if you can find this wine anywhere, especially this this vintage, you gotta get you gotta get it. I get that leather, like, man, it's like okay. So in San Antonio, they have El Mercado, and so they've got, which is the market, if you don't know that. And I can remember as a kid going in there and you have all these leather goods and you got leather wallets and leather boots and all these leather belts and all that. And, and the smell of that, that's what I get off the taste on that. It's like being an El Mercado, a um, little bit of dustiness there. Um, so I get that on the flavor. Um, as far as fruit, probably a cherry. I'll go, go with cherry. And, you know, I know I'm associating it with like a mintiness, but there's like a, a spiciness to it. Um, a spiciness to it. There's a, there's a tad bit of dust and funk to it. Um, it's, it, it, I mean, it tastes old world. It makes you think that, it takes me back to El Mercado, okay? So, but... It really makes me feel old world. It almost makes me feel like being in New Jersey at a relative, you know, at an aunt or, or a grandmother uh, house, um, things like that. When we tasted this, when we tasted these, uh, 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 the Barolo, uh, actually, we had several, a couple of Barolos. Um, I actually equated it. It felt like I was in my aunt, my specifically my aunt's house. Okay, my my, my aunt Carol's house, not not my aunt Brenda's house, who lived with my grandmother. Okay, my aunt Carol's house, her old house. And going in there and smelling all the sauces and all that. I don't get that with this. But, um, I mean, I don't think I could mistake this for anything other than an Italian wine. Let's put it that way. Because um, it, it there's things that are lacking from other parts of the world that, you know, in, in this wine. Or things this wine doesn't have. Um, it's, it's good. It's good. I'm going to drink a little more here. Um, because I don't feel like I've given you enough descriptors other than the leather and the dust and... A little bit of cherry and 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 mint. Well, that's a lot of descriptors, I guess. <clears throat> and in addition to having the high tannins, it has high acid. Perfect for things like uh, pizzas and, and and tomato sauce and all that kind of stuff to, to cut through all that. This is phenomenal. You know, the sad thing about all this stuff is I can't, it's not like I can go back to underground the cellar and be like, hey man, can I get that bottle for $18 again, you know, or even for $40? I can't go back and buy more of it because the deal's all over. And this offer was probably done from six months ago. Anyway, try that. You've got to, I mean, I'm also very enthusiastic about the test wine, but if you if you find this producer, Ada Nada, you got to get some. You got to get some of that wine. It's pretty phenomenal. All right, so we're going to wrap this up. Um, as always, I want to thank everyone for stopping by. Um, as far as the website, when you come to the website, visit the website occasionally. You leave some comments below. I don't keep talk I don't keep talking about comments, but put some comments. Do you like the wine? Have you had the wine? Uh, whatever you want to comment about. Try not to be a spammer because <laughs> it'll automatically go into spam. Uh, click the links above to friend me up or find me elsewhere out on the internet. Hit the donation button over here. Um, to help me uh, buy more wine and pay for equipment and all the good stuff and pay for hosting. Um, there's ads on the webpage, so check them out. 
and uh, links below for the wineries and stuff like that. And um, we will see everyone again next time.